We are incredibly pleased to be partnering with Didier Altinger, Deputy Director of the Centre Pompidou, uh, the Musée National d'Art Moderne of Paris. There's always been a long and warm connection between the Pompidou and Houston, in particular because of Dominique de Menil's sponsorship of the Pompidou at its most critical early stages and from the many exchanges we've done with the museum over the years. When Gary Tintero, our director, told me that we had the possibility of bringing Late Bacon here, I was thrilled to the core. He's one of the artists I first discovered before he was Late Bacon, and I was still a kid, um, and I had been absolutely shattered by my first encounter with Bacon's work in the 1960s. And it was such a privilege to bring this thoughtfully assembled presentation focusing on the late works to Houston. Didier Altinger has taken a very specific view of the work in his presentation and writings about the artist, in particular in regard to how Bacon had responded to the, not only the literature of his time, the writers closest to him, like T.S. Eliot, but also delving deep into antiquity and the tragedies and dramas of Aeschylus. Before the Bacon Project, he did a number of fantastic exhibitions. I'm only going to name a handful. The Futurism in Paris, an avant-garde that was seen in 2008 an in-depth presentation of Edward Hopper, uh, Shadow and Light and the Myth American um, uh, from 2012. Many of you probably saw or heard about the wildly popular Marguerite, the treason of images seen in 2016, and most recently, a major retrospective devoted to the art of David Hockney. Outside of Paris, Didier has co-curated Identity and Alterity, Figures of the Body, 1885 to 1995, that was seen at the Venice Biennale in 1995. And he has served as co-curator of the Sao Paulo Biennale in 1997. These are only a few of his many international projects. It's a great pleasure to welcome to the podium Didier Altinger. Thank you, Alison. Uh, it's indeed a, a real pleasure to be here in Houston. As uh, Alison mentioned, there is a very long history and relation, very precious relation between Houston and the Centre Pompidou, thanks to Madame de Menil in particular. So I will uh, let you know today what's the, the conception of the exhibition as it took place in Paris, which were, uh, which were also emphasizing the relation, as it has been told, between Bacon's painting and literature. So let's start. First of all, to remind, before the late work, before the late period, uh, you will see, probably you have seen it, the, the exhibition is devoted to the 20 last years. But of course, there is a life before that for Bacon and in his painting. Bacon is born in 1909. Uh, he was uh, raised in an English family in Dublin. He was born in Ireland. And uh, during the first uh, part of his life, he was expecting to be a, a, a designer, a furniture designer. And it was, he was quite successful in this way. And he opened a shop in New York, which was a, a very famous place at the time. Of course, you, you will see uh, this type of, uh, of furniture he made, uh, strongly oriented toward what was at the time the, the avant-garde conception of uh, furniture in Paris with uh, Ellen Gray, for instance, and, and people like that. Uh, some of the works he did in his uh, studio as a, a designer, uh, tapestry and other things. And suddenly, in 1927 or 8, there is still an ambiguity about this date, uh, Bacon uh, went to Paris and saw at La Galerie Rosenberg an exhibition devoted to uh, Picasso's drawing. And immediately, in one single day, a single day decided to move from uh, designer to artist. He has no background, he has never been in a school, but 
he knew immediately that it will be his vocation. Uh, what he was uh, interested in was, of course, the Picasso of this time, uh, which is the Picasso where the artist is very close, as it has never been in his life, with surrealism. It's the time where Picasso is making very strange and monstrous figures, like the one you see here. And uh, Bacon has always been focusing on this period of uh, Picasso's painting through in particular, this type of image, uh, which is uh, related to uh, Picasso's biography. In 1928 and 9, he spent summer in a, um, on the coast in France, in Dinard, and it was a place where he had secret meeting with his mistress of the time, Marie-Thérèse Walter. And so they used to meet together in the cabins on the plate, on the sand. And it's why Picasso is um, showing this, this creature, introducing a key in the cabin. This is something which you will see be very important for, for Bacon. Uh, when Bacon was in Paris, he was also, uh, at the same time, living for a while in Chantilly. And Chantilly, uh, in the north part of, uh, of Paris, there is a famous collection, la collection du Duc de Condé, uh, with this work, which has been for, for, for Bacon very seminal in his life. Uh, he said all his life long how he has been struck by the violence of this painting and also by the cry which he saw uh, on the face of his mother uh, um, defending her child. During the same stay in Paris, he saw two uh, films which have been all his life long also um, uh, references. The first one is Le Chien d'Alou. It was the time in Paris when this film was exhibited. Uh, this is the first, the real, very first surrealist film. Uh, so it's an important uh, artwork. Uh, and uh, strangely, when Bacon will remind this film, he will say, oh, I've been uh, especially uh, fascinated by the precision of the image. He was not uh, making reference to the, to the, uh, to the um, extravagancy, to the violence of certain scenes, to the erotism of the film. No, it was the precision of the image. And the same year, he also saw in Paris uh, one film which was for the first time exhibited in, in France, the battleship Potemkin. And you know that one of the also images, which will be very important for him all his life long, is this image of a crying uh, mother also. Uh, it's strange, it's maybe there is some sense. So after this, uh, this stay in Paris, he decided to be a painter. And for a while, uh, he was under the influence of Picasso. Uh, many of the scholars studying uh, Bacon's work considered that there is a Picasso period in his work. But no work is still surviving of this period, which was from, let's say, uh, 29 to... Uh, uh, at least the 40s. So there is many, many painting which has been destroyed by, by Bacon himself. The only way to know this painting is through another artist with whom Picasso, uh, Bacon shared a, a studio in London, Roy de Mestre. It, he was a, a painter coming from Australia. He was a very sophisticated painting and he was really a mentor for, for Bacon for years. And he painted some images of his own studio, and in the studio we can see some painting by Bacon, which have been destroyed after that. But you can see the similarity with uh, surrealist uh, strange figures of uh, Picasso at the time. One of the very first uh, work surviving in the corpus of uh, Bacon's work, this crucifixion uh, in 33, uh, and then suddenly uh, 44. Uh, it's during the Second World War, uh, still in a, in a London which was under the pressure of a bombardment every day, every night. Uh, Bacon uh, worked on this work, uh, three figures at the foot of a crucifixion. And it was uh, very uh, shocking for, for the people when he exhibited for the first time in '45 this work in, his, in an exhibition, in a collective exhibition. Uh, many of the critics of the time thought that Bacon was uh, insane. They didn't understand what was the subject, where this creature came from. Uh, it's just later on, later on, that we, we were able to understand what was the meaning and the purpose of his work. Uh, first of all, after uh, many 
scholarship uh, uh, studies on Bacon's work, we knew that they came from Aeschylus, we shall see later. But uh, what's the meaning of these Erenes? These Erenes, we shall talk later of what they mean. Uh, in the 50, just to mention, Bacon uh, spent some time in South Africa, Rhodesia at the time, because his uh, uh, sister and mother, even, uh, were living there and part of the uh, extension of the British Empire. It's also very important, you will see later. Uh, one of the uh, very important moments, of, of course, is the period when he worked after uh, Velázquez. He was struck by the uh, portrait of Innocentis, this one, by Velázquez. He considered as the most beautiful painting in the world, uh, image of power, but we could say, also say image of a father, a papa, and it's something probably very important. And then there is uh, uh, another artist uh, to whom uh, Bacon dedicated a body of work, uh, Van Gogh. And uh, it was a very uh, interesting painting because this painting was destroyed. Bacon knew it through a reproduction, a black and white reproduction. And it's also a way to, uh, to understand how Bacon is concerned by history. We also uh, see that uh, in depth later. Uh, this painting was destroyed, and it's not something uh, uh, uninteresting for Bacon. It was destroyed during the bombing of Dresden in Germany in '45. So it's a masterwork destroyed by the war. And it's, of course, for Bacon, something very important, how the historical event have a, an impact on painting and on art. And now we are after this uh, uh, introduction coming to the, the heart of the, of the purpose of the exhibition, the painting made by Bacon just before or after this very important uh, moment for him, which was his retrospective organized by the national French state. It was a, an official celebration in this majestic monument, Le Grand Palais in Paris. Uh, it was very important at the time for any painter. Uh, a couple of years later, this same space had been devoted by the French state to a celebration of 85th birthday of Picasso. So it was the place. And Bacon was conscious, and for this exhibition, he decided to work intensively and paint four triptychs in the year just preceding this exhibition. It was very important for him, of course. And you can see Bacon at that time. And for this exhibition, uh, Bacon decided he wanted this exhibition to be as complete as possible. So he asked for his, the loan of his major works. One of the major works was the one you have on the right, which is the painting, uh, 46, belonging to the Museum of Modern Art in New York. It was a very daring acquisition at the time. It was bought by Alfred Barr. Uh, in uh, 48, which was in a time when nobody knows who was this Francis Bacon, but Barr did it, so it's, it's exceptional. But this painting, as Bacon was not uh, coming from an art school, was experimental in his technique, so it was fragile. And the MoMA declined the loan, first of all, and Bacon decided to paint a new version of it, the one you find on the left. And you can see through the comparison between these two images, what did happen around this year, this crucial year of 71. Uh, it's more simple, it's more brilliant in the drawing, uh, it's more intense uh, in the color. Uh, this is a new way, uh, a new art, in fact, uh, for Bacon. Now, what is interesting also is that finally, after negotiation, the MoMA decided to lend this painting, and Bacon said, okay, and hung the two paintings close one to another, which is also the demonstration that he feel enough confident in his, in his skill and his technique at that time to prove to the viewer that he was better now than he was before, in a way. He made also another interpretation of a work which was not, which was not learned uh, to the exhibition, which is the Red Pope, and he made this new version on, on, the, on the left. It's quite important because for someone like him, making an interpretation of his work is a real demonstration of his ability and of the progress he made. This painting of 44 
later on, he made also a, um, a replica, which is this one, doubled in scale in a completely different style. And from one to another, you also can uh, see what is the evolution of his style. It's more simple. The, there is almost no matter on the, on the canvas. It's uh, uh, immaculate in a way. We shall, we shall come back on this term. And uh, the uh, 71 exhibition is also a crucial moment in his life because uh, a couple of days before the opening, the guy with whom he came to Paris, his companion, George Dyer, commits suicide. He was a very fragile guy. Uh, Bacon saved it, save him one time, a month uh, earlier, but this time he was out in Paris. And he, when he came back to the hotel, he shared with him, uh, George Dyer was dead. Uh, and, of course, it was a very important uh, moment, a sentimental and, of course, psychological uh, moment for, for Bacon to, to face this, uh, this death. Uh, what this, uh, for for uh, remembering uh, George Dyer and the events which took place in Paris at that time, he painted three triptychs. Uh, one um, English cr uh, critic, uh, Hughes Davis, in 75, in uh, an American magazine, Art Forum, called them the Black Triptych, uh, which was probably in his mind a kind of reference of another black painting, which, was the, which are the, the Goya's painting, of course. Uh, it means that these paintings are uh, very uh, uh, dramatic, and the first of them, the, the first of the three, is this one, probably the more realistic, uh, with a description in the central panel of this hotel, Rue des Saint-Père, where the tragedy took place. Uh, two things uh, I would like to emphasize immediately about this painting. On the right panel, you see uh, George Dyer, like all the painting and portrait made by Bacon, there is a photographic reference. Uh, this is something very specific to Bacon, uh, and it's why he's a modern painter. It's why he's challenging uh, the time where he painted his work. Uh, he wanted to, to be able to produce images as powerful as the, the new and modern images could be, photography and cinema. And it's why always he worked on the after photography. So on the right, this is the source for many of his portraits of uh, George Dyer. On the left, it's interesting, um, probably for the, the posture, the, the noble posture he gave to, to Dyer, but also because uh, Michelangelo is one of his great, great permanent reference. Uh, Bacon was fascinated in, uh, specifically by the, 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 the study of the body, of the, of the back generally uh, by Michelangelo, and you will see later, he will quote this reference in a, in a triptych. Uh, you, you have seen how um, Dyer is represented on the right panel, and it will be something uh, which will be used by uh, Bacon quite regularly when he will uh, portrait, give portrait of, uh, of George Dyer. You can see him through the reflection of his, of his uh, face in a mirror, or in a kind of mirror. And this uh, dispositive, this, this way of, of, of painting, came from this painting, which is, for Francis Bacon, probably the most sensual and erotic painting in the uh, history of art of all, uh, all the history of art. This is La Toilette de Venus, which is part of, a, of course, National Gallery in London, a work and a museum that Bacon knew perfectly, and this image, is, is, this image is associated to Bacon with the idea of the representation of desire, of erotism. So when it's dire with the subject, he is shown like that with a face in the mirror. You can see him, another uh, representation of Dyer, and there is the same uh, construction of the image. Same thing here, you see. Uh, Images right and left, Dyer is also uh, in a mirror. About the, the influence of Picasso, I told you there is this uh, personal story of Picasso being at the beach, uh, meeting his, uh, his lover, uh, and there is many uh, quotations of this image in uh, Bacon's work with people uh, turning keys like that, or this later one, which is in the exhibition you, you will see here. 
Well, the second triptych painted by, by Bacon, I told you there is three uh, black triptych. The second one is, is this one. Um, and you can see a kind of uh, quite literal uh, narrative of the events as it took place in this hotel from the uh, uh, death on the left. When Bacon came back, he found his friend like that on the death. And there is probably one of the first appearance of these figures in the shadow on the, you see on the floor, uh, which could be the anticipation of the Erenes that we shall see in many of Bacon's painting. And we shall, I shall explain where these images come from. And this is the third version, the, the triptych also in the exhibition in Houston, which belonged to the Tate. Uh, and you see in the time how for the same subject, with the same preoccupation, Bacon simplified uh, his style and his imagery. This is the third one, and this is the more synthetic one. And if you, you, will, you will see closely how we paint in the center panel uh, the image of these two wrestlers, it's absolutely the brilliant. Uh, it's like probably Velasquez, as he was willing to do. Uh, one subject which is also very important, uh, the, the role and the significance of the shadow. Uh, Bacon used to say uh, death is the shadow of life. And if you, if you want to paint life, you have to consider death so shadow. And you see many of the uh, people painted by Bacon who are in between two words, between light and between shadows. And of course, shadows on the left panel is in a way hitting the figure of Dyer. So we come to the, the exhibition as it was in, uh, in Paris. Um, the idea in Paris was to confront Bacon's painting with his library, with some books of his library. Uh, this is a library which is very well known. It, uh, the inventory has been done very closely, precisely, by uh, uh, a museum in, uh, in Dublin, the birthplace of, uh, of Bacon, uh, Trinity College. And so we know perfectly that there is almost 1,000 books. Uh, I've been there to see these books, and what struck me, and probably the idea of the exhibition came from that, uh, these books were all very used. All of them were covered, maculate with painting. When you open this book, you can see that there is some quotation, Bacon underlined. Sometimes he made some small drawing in the margin and so on. So it means that these books are more than uh, books to decorate a library. But this is really books he used every day in the studio in a way. So the purpose was how to identify in this wide corpus uh, an amount of books which could make sense. So I, I selected six of them, you will see, uh, which was part of his library. And the, the reason why I, I did so is that these books, when you will consider each of them as a group after that, you will see that there is a strong uh, intellectual affinities between these authors. Uh, there is, in a way, the same kind of vision of the world, uh, I, I shall explain. Uh, and it's really, this sixth book made a, a kind of a spiritual family uh, which explain what are the real goal and um, the deep meaning of Bacon's work, I think. So the first of them is Aeschylus. Uh, Aeschylus, uh, the encounter with Bacon, if we can say, uh, took place in 1939. Uh, and uh, Bacon at that time in London saw several times, six times, it was mentioned by certain of the biographers, um, uh, um, uh, a play by T.S. Eliot, Family Reunion. So it was the first encounter, and Bacon was fascinated by the story. The story um, of the uh, uh, Eliot piece was the uh, transposition of the Orestia in the Great Britain of the modern time. And you know the story is a story of death, it's a story of killing, it's a story of a family which uh, each member is killing another, it's, it's absolutely uh, uh, cruel and, and violent. In 42, Bacon was so interested by this uh, um, history, by uh, Aeschylus, that he read intensively this book, which was published, and it's a scholar from 
Ireland, who also uh, published this, this book, which was seminal for, for Bacon, and uh, Stanford, who is the author, proposed some new translation of some of the, of the text of Aeschylus, and this translation uh, entered in uh, Bacon's mind for years, and he will quote them uh, later on. This is the, the play by, by Eliot. Uh, the story of, uh, of the Orestia, very, very fast to, to, to explain, it's about uh, death in, in a single family. First of all, uh, the story starts with the sacrifice of Iphigenie. Uh, you know, uh, uh, the father of Iphigenie, Agamemnon, was the king of the Greek uh, at the head of the, uh, of the vessels from all the colony of, Greek, of Greece going to Troy. Uh, and to have a favorable wind, he decided to sacrifice his own daughter, Iphigenie. When he came back from the war, his wife, uh, Clytemnestre, was so angry that she was waiting him and provoked his assassination. After that, Orest, the son of Agamemnon, decided to uh, kill his own mother. It's, it's an awful story. And he was, of course, after that, uh, tracked by this creature you see above the image, which are the Arenes. Uh, they are all in, in the Roman world, they are called the Fury. Uh, later on, they are also called uh, les Omenides, but it's the Arenes. And, and they are uh, coming from the very archaic Greek world to uh, track the criminal uh, who has uh, in a single family in the same blood, in a way. And from 75 on, Bacon reminds uh, his, his creature, his amenis, and they came in his painting and seems to be everywhere in his painting. Uh, when he was asked about these figures, what do they mean? Uh, he used to say, they are the images of my guilt. Uh, he felt guilty after the death of George Dyer because, in fact, he knew that he was, in a way, responsible for his death, and he gave to this creature uh, the, the image of his guilt. So, uh, this is one triptych which is inspired directly by the Orestia, and you see from the panel right and la left, these arenes, and in the center, an image, a representation, which is usually uh, interpreted as an image of Agamemnon himself. And there is some arenes like that, you see, even in this painting. Uh, for Bacon, uh, uh, Aeschylus, when, when he wanted to resume what's the meaning of and the impact of the uh, poetry and tragedy of uh, Aeschylus in his work, he said, it's blood. This is blood. And he painted blood like this one on a pavement, like this one, and this one, which is in the exhibition you can see here in Houston. There is blood on the walkway, which is the most important uh, um, image in this, in this composition. And of course, the, the sky himself became a kind of blood. The second offer, logically, in a way, after Aeschylus was uh, Nietzsche. Uh, when uh, later, later on, um, Michel Leris, uh, we shall talk about him, uh, was asked about uh, Francis Bacon, he said, he is a Nietzschean. If you want to resume, what's this man, Bacon, he is close to Nietzsche philosophy. Uh, and of course, Bacon was attracted, first of all, by this book, uh, where um, Nietzsche explained what is the genesis of the Greek tragedy. It means of Aeschylus, in a way. So it was, for Bacon, a way to, to go deeper in the understanding of this uh, Aeschylus tragedy. And in this book, there is something very famous, of course. Uh, this is in this book that uh, uh, Nietzsche explained that uh, the birth, the tragedy, the, the very first Greek tragedy, comes from the dialogue between two gods. One of them is uh, Dionysios, and the other is Apollo. And here you can see an image of a young Dionysos. This young Dionysos has a teacher. This is the man you see in the center. And you can imagine that with such a teacher, Dionysos will be very special. Dionysos uh, is the god of the wine. Uh, he is always, like his mentor, you can see here, uh, um, 
the man of the excess, the man of the uh, ebriety, the man of uh, uh, violence, the man of the sex uh, expanded, and so on. Always out of control, in a way. Here you can see again uh, Bacchus. Uh, this time, this is Dionysus himself. Bacchus is the name given by the Roman. And you can see him with people who are making the wine, Velasquez. You can see again him with all the girls who are part of his uh, celebration, les menades. And uh, the other one, uh, except uh, the other source of, exp of inspiration for the tragedy for Nietzsche is Apollo. Apollo, this is the opposite, you know. Uh, he is the god of the light. He is the god of the, of the shape. He is the god of the beauty. And when, uh, so you can see him uh, in Redons, he is the man who each morning drives the char uh, to open the new day with the rise of the sun. He is the god of the, of the light. And when, um, when Nietzsche wants to uh, emphasize the specific domain of expression of each of his uh, uh, god, he used to say, uh, of course, Dionysos is the, is the man who inspired the, the excess. So uh, this uh, is the, ins the inspiration for musician. Music is the art which is associated to uh, um, to Dionysos. Why? Because it has no shape. Uh, it has no form, in a way, a visible form. And on the contrary, Apollo is the god inspiring painting and sculpture, which means the art of the shape, of the, of the beauty, of the, of the clear uh, appearance of the beauty. Uh, of course, this interest of Bacon for tragedy will drive him, will drive him to work after some major work. Here, this is after Ingres. This is the source, uh, a painting which belongs to the Musée du Louvre. And this is the, the version of, uh, of Francis Bacon. Uh, you see there is this RNA also in the door. And about uh, alors, Bacon, of course, was interested probably by this idea that Dionysus was not inspiring painting, but Dionysus was the protector and the inspiring figure for Bacon, M much more than Apollon. You know all the story about the excess in his life. Uh, Bacon was a heavy drinker. He, was, he has a very passionate life. He has a very free sexual life and so on. So he is on the side of Dionysus. And he, probably he asked himself, can I, how can, can I transfer? How can I work on this idea that Dionysus is not made for the painter? Uh, but he had a reference for that. Someone asked the same question, questions in the early 30s. This man is a surrealist. It's uh, uh, André Masson. You can see him on the right and, uh, of course, Miro on the, on the left. And you can see this is another demonstration. I have no time to explain that in depth, but you can see how Bacon seems to be happy uh, on the day of the opening of his exhibition in Paris. Uh, to be uh, in between these two men, because Bacon was, in fact, uh, very attracted by surrealism. Uh, when he starts working and painting, he thought he was a surrealist. When he heard that in 36, André Breton organized in London an exhibition devoted to the international surrealist, he asked to the, uh, to the curator of his show in Great Britain uh, to come to his studio proposing his painting a surrealist. And they came back and said, no, it's not enough surrealist. But probably for Bacon, this is some way, something which is very important and there is many uh, connection and, uh, in surrealism. It's why probably he's so pleased to be in between these two master, great master of surrealism. But uh, what I wanted to say is that Masson uh, was a very Dionysiac painter. And in the 30s, in a very theoretical way, with his friend George Bataille, he tried to figure what could be a Dionysiac painter, painting. And Bacon, uh, Bataille gave to the name of his possible painting the term of informe. 
and he, he made a, very, a veritable uh, treatise about what could be this uh, informed painting. And for André Masson, of course, the flux which is characteristic of uh, uh, Dionysos' inspiration, the one from the music and so on, is transferred uh, in, uh, in Masson's painting by his representation of metamorphosis, of course. This is typically the inspiration of Dionysos against the shape and definitive and close uh, shape of uh, uh, the Apollon inspiration, for instance. So there is many, many uh, painting in uh, Masson's corpus uh, devoted to metamorphosis. This is another one, 39. And Bacon, uh, in his turn, probably uh, tried to figure what could be this Dionysus painting, a painting without any shape, and it gave this type of uh, representation, a dune, uh, sand which has no, no shape, no form by, by definition, water or vapor, uh, gas, and there is many uh, representation of uh, this type in Bacon, and there is the most uh, informed and improbable, improbable uh, shape in the world, water. Water has no shape. Uh, it's, it's, it's the uh, representation itself of a flux, so it's by definition the Dionysus subject, and Bacon made in, uh, 92, in 82 this representation of water uh, coming from a, a, a tap. It's also in the exhibition. It's very important for Bacon, this painting. In 1985, he was again interviewed by David Sylvester in his studio. This painting was in his studio, and he designed this painting. He, he said to Sylvester, this is the perfect painting, what I've always wanted to achieve as a painter. Uh, and, and Sylvester asked why it's strange. Uh, Bacon answered, uh, because it's immaculate, first of all. This is typically uh, the immaculate painting he wanted to produce after uh, 71, for instance. Nothing comparable with what he made before. You see, it's, uh, it's clear, very, very precise, um, almost no matter on the painting, in a way. And another uh, Dionysus subject, jet of water. Another way to represent tragedy uh, through uh, Aeschylus and, uh, and Nietzsche, it's this triptych. Uh, since many years, uh, Bacon uh, was interested by the project of being able to make a single image of the history of the modern uh, Europe in 20th century. His studio was a veritable mess. It was filled with images coming from magazines, uh, thousands of images. He took two of them from this magma and made this triptych. One of the images came from a photography, as usual, uh, taken in 1919, the American President Woodrow Wilson uh, coming out of Le Quai d'Orsay. Of course, this image is associated with a very specific meaning, the First World War. Le Traité de Versailles was just after the defeat of a German army in 18, and of course, the treaty was considered by the German as very rude and rough, and it was at the origin of the Second World War, probably. So it's war. And the second image is a detail from this one, which was a photography taken in the place where Leon Trotsky was killed in 1940. Trotsky, this is one of the founders of the URSS rep uh, revolution. He was a, one of the very first Bolshevik. So he's associated with the ideology, uh, which is also something uh, which uh, happened in the 20th century. So finally, this image, uh, for Bacon of the, of the 20th century in Europe, it's war and ideology. The two, uh, the two events uh, which uh, almost destroyed Europe during the 20th century. Another uh, poet very important for Bacon, T.S. Eliot, he used to say, I know Eliot by art, and that's true. Uh, during the interview, when, he, when Bacon is filmed, he can say an uh, entire poem of, uh, of uh, T.S. Eliot. Uh, in 67, uh, one of his readings of Eliot just inspired him uh, a, a painting, this one. Um, and 
the title is not by Bacon, but he never completely uh, design, uh, refute this, uh, this uh, association with, with Eliot. And there is many interpretation of what it could mean, uh, probably uh, based on the uh, story of Sweeney Agonist, uh, which is the story of the assassination of two prostitutes in the poem. It could be that, it could be other, other meaning, but anyway, connected to Eliot. Um, Eliot inspired him, of course, through his major poem, Wasteland, uh, some of the landscape. Probably, we could say, all the landscape uh, from Francis Bacon, and he painted 12 of them from 71 to his death, uh, could be inspired by Eliot. This one. And Eliot also inspired this, uh, this triptych. Uh, it's based, we know, uh, on a, a poem of 1920 by uh, Eliot, uh, Suine Erect, uh, which is uh, associated for Eliot um, to a very important and very popular figure of the English culture, Suine, Suine Todd. You know, it's, uh, probably you know him. It's interesting for Bacon because he, he was a barber and a, a, a killer at the same time. He used to kill the people who come to shave. So it's an inspiration for, for Bacon in this painting. Uh, this is the triptych where you can see the more clearly what is the fascination of Bacon for the study of back, um, human back by uh, Michelangelo. This one is really generally associated with that. Um, if Bacon is interested by Eliot, of course, this is for the meaning of his, of his poetry, for the, the, the power of the image he is a, uh, Eliot is able to produce in Bacon's mind, but also for the technical, in a way we could say. Uh, you know, Wasteland is a poem uh, composed with seven different languages. It's a veritable collage. And this idea of collage is something you can see in every single painting of Bacon, very important. We could say Bacon's painting are, a way, in a way, collage too, to confront texts from different sources. Uh, in, the, in the poem of Eliot, there is some quotation of La, La Légende du Graal, there is some quotation from Dante, there is many, many sources. And in a way, this is an inspiration also for, for Bacon. This is the manuscript that Bacon knew quite well because it was published in 62. Uh, this is the manuscript which has been uh, corrected by uh, Ezra Pound. This is an example of this transposition of what could be the, the collage, the dispositive of the collage in the Eliot's painting. You see there is uh, the image is a, a, a reproduction of a black and white portrait, photographic portrait of Bacon. Behind you have or around this image you have the, the naked canvas, the matter, the, the, and you have this, this body which is also a, a, a kind of collage. And as a reference to this collage, which could be rooted in the, in the Cubist tradition, you have at the feet of the figure uh, um, a paper with some, some text which is also uh, connected to, to the collage tradition. Another great uh, novelist, uh, important for Bacon, Joseph Conrad, and this particular text, Art of Darkness. Uh, you know, of course, the story as everyone, because it was the, the narrative inspiring um, Coppola for his film, uh, Apocalypse Now. And this is the story of the, in a way, all these authors have in common to deal with contradictory notions and values. The, the, um, the heart of darkness could be uh, the demonstration of the perfect reversibility of barbary and culture. Uh, it starts with culture, it becomes barbary, and in the other sense. And it's why it's also very interesting for, for Bacon. It inspired him this triptych, a triptych where we used to say one figure could be uh, Peter Beard, we shall talk about him, and on the left, probably the man with the center figure of uh, um, Conrad's novel, uh, Kurzt. You know, this man who became very primitive in a way. And in the center, there is an image uh, which could be, alors, this is Peter Beard. Peter Beard is important for Bacon because, uh, as I told you, Bacon in the 50s went in the South Africa to visit his mother and his sister, and he was probably shocked 
uh, by what he saw, uh, how the um, English Empire destroyed some culture by um, the goodwill of promoting civilization and uh, good values. Uh, so he had this idea of coloni colonialism, which had a new step when he met this man. This man was a journalist and a photographer, and in 65, he published this book about the, ex the extension. Uh, Peter Baird lived for several years in Kenya, in Africa, and then he was the witness of the destruction of the elephants by the people who were trading Ivory. So he published this book, and in 65 he gave a, a kind of lecture in London, and Bacon came to him and just immediately uh, told, talk with him and speak about uh, Conrad. It was an association for him with the, the narrative of the uh, Heart of Darkness. There is another man uh, who could have been very seminal uh, about this story and the the way Bacon has this conscious uh, of what was the excess of colonialism. Uh, this is Michel Leris, who was in the 30s uh, an ethnologist and was part of a mission very important in Africa. And when he came back, he published this book, which was very uh, 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 a denunciation of what was the, this time the French colonialism in, uh, in, in Africa. The central image, as I told you, could be inspired by this one, a representation of um, Promete, in fact. Uh, and Promete, you know, in the mythology, is the god who gave to the men the fire with whom they could develop industry and they could develop a kind of materialistic world. And of course, for Bacon, putting this image in the center of a triptych, it's a way uh, of the denouncing uh, what is the hubris of the Occidental uh, civilization based on this technology and this uh, progress. Uh, Michel Leris. Michel Leris, uh, Bacon, uh, this is a French author, this is a poet, but this is, before all, uh, an ethnologist. Uh, as a young man, I told you he was part of some uh, experimental uh, trip in Africa as an ethnologist, um, but he was also very close to the surrealist group. First of all, very close with Breton and all the people, then to Georges Bataille, uh, and he was also the very first one to devote uh, a text about Giacometti's sculpture in 1929. Uh, he was also a close friend of Picasso. In a world, he was the man uh, to whom Bacon would be identified. All the people around Leris are the people that Bacon admired. So he wanted to get in touch with this man. Finally, it happens in 65, uh, Michel Leris came to the opening of a Giacometti retrospective in London at the Tate. They meet, and when uh, Leris came back in Paris, he sent to Bacon this book, which was republished, this is a book initially from 38, but it was republished in 62, and this is the new version that uh, Leris sent to Bacon. Here is Michel Leris. And a couple of months later, we could see in Bacon's work the uh, first representation of Corrida, uh, because, of course, this is the core of the text of Michel Leris. Uh, in this book, Michel Leris developed uh, a parallel between the torero and the artist. He said this is the same thing. Uh, the writer of the painter is in the same position and he, he has the same uh, perspective. What is this perspective? It's to transform uh, the most violent primitive energy, the one of the bull, in something which is perfectly uh, mathematically precise, the circle and other figures of the choreography of the corrida. And this is exactly what Bacon used to do in his painting. Deep in the more obscure and more violent, with crime, with sexuality, with all you can do, and promote that to produce a, a mathematical beauty in a way. This is this Miroir de la Tauromachie, the only book that Bacon decided to illustrate, he was against the idea of illustration, but for Michel Leris, he made an exception and made in 90 this, uh, this book with six of his uh, images reproduced in it. 
The other one was Georges Bataille. Georges Bataille, uh, you know, it's also uh, someone who is close to the surrealist movement and very well known at the end of the 20s by publishing a magazine, the Document magazine, which was a very powerful uh, magazine. Uh, most of the people who composed uh, this magazine were ethnologists. So it's why this book, this magazine, is full of reference, of sacrifice, of mythology, and all the studies which were uh, promoted by the ethnologists of the time. And Bacon discovered this magazine uh, in which you could find some article um, with illustration made by some of the most important uh, surrealist photographers, like Elie Lothar. And one of these articles was devoted to Slaughterhouse. And Bacon was fascinated by these images and it, by this idea, and he gave some of the portrait he himself organized by Deakin, showing him with piece of, of, uh, of and this kind of image too, meat. Bacon and uh, Georges Bataille have a very uh, particular story too. In '62, uh, one of the late the, the last uh, book of uh, Georges Bataille, Les Larmes d'Eros, uh, The Cry of Eros, à peu près, uh, introduced a, a reproduction of a Bacon's painting. In 62, nobody knew who was Bacon, but Georges Bataille was the very first, in France in particular, to reproduce an image of Bacon, which was this one. This one, which was very controversial at the time of his exhibition, uh, it's based as many of uh, Bacon's painting on some photography by Muybridge. There is a body of uh, study by Muybridge of Whistler. Bacon gives them, of course, another m meaning by put putting them on a bed, and this image explicit uh, provoked many uh, controversy in London I around the mid-50s. This is the images, the sources images by uh, Muybridge. And another example of the impact of Weybridge, it's this triptych, which is in Houston, uh, where you can see uh, the lateral panel inspired by this uh, woman in a hammock, like that. This is a, an image of a revue document. Another article which was very important for Bacon was the mouth, uh, mouth with photography by Boifard, another important surrealist painter, and some of the very first uh, image of uh, crying figures could be related to this article published in Document and, uh, and by, by Bataille. You know, the very, the very first uh, open mouth like that. And even the cry of a, of a pope could be related to these images. Another article which was important in, uh, in this uh, document, uh, a study which was devoted to this um, Apocalypse de saint Sever an old document from the 9th century, and the winged uh, creature uh, could have been also a, a source for uh, the very first uh, Arrhenes of 44, the painting we saw. Another image, very important, uh, Georges Bataille was Nietzschean, absolutely the more Nietzschean of all the French uh, literature men. Um, he was, of course, uh, fascinated by the figure of Dionysus, and in, uh, in 37, he asked to his best friend, um, André Masson, to make a drawing to resume and give, in a single image, the meaning of his philosophy. And Masson designed this figure, Acéphale. And the meaning of it was we have to promote a new conception of humanity uh, which could be uh, liberated from the reign of the mind, of the head. Uh, a humanity which could be more concerned by instinct world, by sexuality, by pulsion, and so on. And it's why uh, Masson painted, that, uh, drew this, this image. And as an answer, Bacon never said that, but it's very striking to see that in 81, 82, he painted this figure without head with probably exactly the same meaning. Say, so, yes, my, either, my, either, my ideal uh, representation of humanity is this one. 
an image of uh, what was Bacon Studio. You can see what a mess it was. If you are interested, it has been transferred with archaeologists to Dublin. The birth and if you go to Dublin in Ireland, you will see precisely this, uh, this studio. And this one was clean because after, uh, before that it was even worse. Just a few words about uh, um, something which appeared to me during the exhibition. Uh, Bacon, at several moments in his life, when he's interviewed, uh, said, hmm, there is a, the most important painter of 20th century is Marcel Duchamp. It's very unexpected, and people didn't care because it seems so extravagant to say that. Uh, but we know that in '69, Bacon bought the Catalogue Raisonné, which was published that same year by Arturo Schwartz in Milano. And uh, we know that Bacon had this book in his studio, uh, as usual, manipulating it, uh, taking some image of the book, making some drawing over it, and it was a very important source. What could be the connection between uh, Bacon and, and Marcel Duchamp? It's, it's not obvious, but both of them are fascinated by the chrono photography. For uh, Bacon, as you have seen, this is Muybridge. For uh, Marcel Duchamp, this is Jules Etienne Marais. Uh, this is the equivalent in the French uh, tradition at the end of the 20th, 19th century. And uh, why are they interested, both of them, by these images, then by cinema? Probably because they have the same interest by the possibility of representing not life as in a single and uh, frozen image, but with the development. Same idea we found with Masson about the metamorphose. Uh, these images are, in a way, images of the life itself. Uh, not the single image, but the movement, the, the alteration of the, of the image through the passage of life. So they, they, they share the same interest. And uh, for Marcel Duchamp, it gave the very famous nude descending a staircase, you know perfectly this painting. It was the, the, the scandalous painting of the Armory Show in New York in 1913, and it became one of the most famous paintings of the 20th century. But it came from this chronophotography, same source. Another uh, point they shared together. Uh, Duchamp was very interested by representing, by painting flesh. Uh, so, in 1912, he decided to go to Basel, then to Munich, and to see specifically the painting by Luca Granach. Luca Granach uh, was considered by Duchamp as the painter who painted the flesh uh, in the best way possible. It's really like skin, like you see the tender, you see the color and everything. So, he was fascinated and coming back to Paris, he painted this bride, in his mind, using the same color, the same technique as uh, Granach. Uh, and of course, uh, this is something which is, uh, flesh is fundamental if you uh, want to understand Bacon's painting. He's probably uh, in the second half of the 20th century, the one who is at the highest level interested by representing uh, flesh because he has himself this incredible interest for, for this. Another uh, point of contact between the two, uh, gambling. Uh, both of them are incredible uh, gamblers. Uh, Duchamp spent quite a long time in Monaco, in the south of France, going to the casino, and to earn some money, he imagined that he could sell some obligation like that. And Bacon, later on, spent many, many months. He had a studio. He spent almost uh, several years in Monaco also, where we know he spent incredible amount of money. He spent all his money. He was so poor that he has to, to paint on the, on the back. This, this was the beginning of his use of the back of the canvas. He couldn't afford to buy new canvas, so he has to, to use the, the, uh, the, the one he, he has used, but on the other side. And more than that, uh, when Bacon said Marcel Duchamp is the greatest painter of the 20th century, people used to say, but mm, how can you say that? And Bacon uh, said, because he is the man who was able to conceal 
uh, the highest and the more precise uh, representation of flesh in the most abstract way. And it's what, in fact, uh, Duchamp made with this part. The color is not good because here this is the reproduction by Hamilton. But in the version which is in uh, Philadelphia, you can see how um, Duchamp was concerned by this idea of representing flesh on his big uh, glass. And it's what uh, Bacon found it was uh, so important. And you can see in many of uh, Bacon's painting this kind of shape where the flesh seems to become liquid and at the base of the figures, reminding, of course, the representation of Duchamp in Le Grand Vert. You have this one on the, on the right detail of it. You have here another thing in this painting, we know that there is a source in Duchamp's work. Look the shape of the geometric uh, shape in which the figures are inserted. And it came from here, uh, a work by 1919 in Duchamp. Uh, there is something also in the catalogue raisonné of Duchamp, very funny. This is La Porte du 11 Rue Larré. Uh, this is a door that Duchamp built himself in the studio he, where he was living. And this door was at the same time closing and opening. It's, it's a paradox cycle which was interesting for, for Duchamp. And Bacon painted that. This is here, the full images. And it comes from here with the same idea, probably. And this idea is not just a joke. Uh, it's, in fact, a deeper connection and meaning for Duchamp and for Bacon. Uh, this is a way to express uh, a real vision of a world which is based on what was the very, very old philosophy at the time of the Greek tragedy by someone like uh, Heraclitus, for instance. Uh, the idea that world is made of opposition playing one with, with another. Uh, it's, a, it's an agonistic vision of the world with contradictions always uh, playing uh, in front of us. Uh, and this uh, idea, this philosophical idea, was expressed by uh, the way Bacon, very often, we could say always, um, painted uh, people, figures, who are on the uh, le seuil. Fre threshold. Threshold is very important. Bain Bacon could be the, the painter of threshold. It means that his figures are at the same time in the obscurity, in the light, they are in depth, in depth and live and so on. And it's the same idea that uh, Marcel Dussan shared when he expressed this goal of his uh, work, which was, in French, uh, sorry, la co-intelligence des contraires, which is the core of uh, Duchamp's philosophy. Another uh, detail, you know, for, uh, to paint this uh, panel, which was designed to uh, decorate Mrs. Dyer's uh, library, one of the sponsors of Marcel Duchamp, he used uh, the finger and the hand. He asked to uh, uh, a professional uh, advertising painter to, to design this, this thing. And you can see there is some reminiscence in, uh, in Bacon's work, too. Another interesting connection between the two, uh, you know this very famous uh, photo taken by uh, Man Ray of the Grand Vert as it was in progress and called Elvage de Poussière, dust. Uh, and dust is very fascinating for uh, Duchamp. And of course, Bacon was also fascinated by dust. This is the first time he used in 45 uh, dust uh, taken from the ground of his studio. He wanted to paint uh, a, a, a suit in, in a, such a realistic way, but he couldn't paint it with paint. So he used the dust and was very pleased with it. And the dust uh, will reappear in the very last work achieved by uh, Francis Bacon, this bull of 91. Uh, and if you go and look at it in the exhibition here in Houston, you will see in the black, there is, in fact, many dust. And when Bacon was asked about the use of the dust, he answered in a very simple and very profound way, as he used to do, dust is the only eternal thing. Thank you. <laughs>